Hey friends, welcome to another episode of Strange Planet. And on this episode, Bigfoot in the Southern United States. But first, if you'd like to get a little deeper into Strange Planet and become a premium subscriber, it's real easy to do. Plus, you gain access to commercial-free listening, special bonus episodes produced exclusively for premium subscribers, and you receive my monthly newsletter, Inner Sanctum. All you need to do is click on the link in the episode notes, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm. All right, examining cryptozoology's greatest mystery in the southern United States, that's where we're headed with Christian Moore, or sorry, that's where we're headed with Chester Moore. Chester is an award-winning wildlife journalist, speaker, cons- conservationist. He's the host of Moore Outdoors on News Talk AM 560 KLVI, and he's the host of Higher Calling Wildlife and Dark Outdoors podcasts, and he's the editor-in-chief of Texas Fish and Game. Chester, welcome to Strange Planet. How are you? Oh, man, it's great to be here. Appreciate the opportunity, Richard. So this book originally uh, was published back in 2004. Uh, tell us about the, uh, the new edition, uh, new and, and up- updated edition of Bigfoot South. Yeah, so, you know, this is a very niche sort of market, you know. So, like, when I was hosting my own cryptozoology conferences, I uh, did Bigfoot South and just did enough books for a season of conferences and did uh, then went to other stuff. And then opportunities kept coming up in terms of uh, stories would come in, research would happen. And uh, I thought coming up here on the 20th anniversary would be great to put out, you know, uh, the book again. But to add a bunch of stuff to it, you know, to put a fresh coat of paint on it and give a bunch of, you know, really advanced level journalistic looks into this thing from 20 years, you know, looking back. And uh, so I'm real happy with how it came out. I mean, it's, it's got a lot of neat stuff in it. And um, I think anyone who had the first edition will love this one. And people who didn't are going to have a real treat because it's, uh, I think it's a different look at the phenomenon in the South. Exactly. Yeah. Because we, we tend to uh, equate Sasquatch with the Pacific Northwest. Uh, yeah. And sometimes, uh, except for those in the know, Bigfoot sightings in the southern U.S. kind of get short shrift or they get overlooked. So what is kind mm-hmm. of the, the history of Bigfoot in, in the south? Well, I come at this from a journalistic perspective, you know, uh, looking at it from uh, someone who gathers stories and tells stories as a wildlife journalist. And just from that perspective, if you go back into like newspaper reports and you know, hunting magazines and things, you know, the word Bigfoot wasn't used because the word Bigfoot was derived in California in the 1950s. But people would talk about seeing a bush ape or a booger or, you know, some other swamp devil. And they were describing the same thing that people would talk about essentially as they are in the Pacific Northwest. And, um, you know, I don't really think in the South, it was until the legend of Boggy Creek, Charles Pierce's docudrama came out in the 1970s that, that it really kind of, um, it came out a few years after the Patterson Gimlin film, 1967. It's like five years later. And I think those two things happened to be, hold on a second. That probably the same thing over there in California that people were reporting in Arkansas. And so there's a real history of things. But really, interestingly, even up when I first started interviewing people on this 20-plus years ago, a lot of people in the South, if you said Bigfoot, would be like, you know, deer in the headlights. But have you seen anything strange? Has, has anyone ever reported seeing a booger or whatever? And then people would open up and start telling stories. So some of it's like semantics, but there is a rich history of people seeing strange, mysterious, primate-like animals in the southern United States. So let's zero on zero in on uh, your state of, of Texas. Yeah. Um, I mean, are the, Texas is, you know, it, it's, it should be a country all unto itself. It's got sure. such, you know, varied geographical features and so forth and climate. And uh, I mean, is there a, is there a, a, Bigfoot type creature specific to southwestern Texas versus the northeast, let's say. Just walk us through the, the various uh, Bigfoot creatures in, in uh, the Lone Star State. 
Well, you know, there are no Bigfoot experts. That's the good news for everyone. But uh, it's also kind of the bad news. We haven't proven it yet. So it's kind of hard to break down if there's any specific kind of creatures in different parts of the state. But you brought up a great point about um, the geography in the, in the, the, you know, the whole state of Texas. I mean, I live literally in the easternmost city. And it's 857 miles to the westernmost city. I mean, that's huge. Mm-hmm. Bigger than any European country other than Russia, I think, you know. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of, of, of difference in wildlife. And, you know, John Green in his great book from the 70s, Sasquatch to Apes Among Us, had a theory that most of the sightings were in areas that had above, I forget the number now, a certain amount of rain per year, you know. Mm-hmm. So if you look if you look at that, the more arid regions of Texas have very few reports and the and the wetter regions of Texas, like where I live, are where the most of the reports are. Like so, eastern Texas, eastern third of the Texas, we call the Piney Woods, is where most of the reports are, and most of them are around these dense river bottom areas. However, there are very legitimate reports in the Edwards Plateau, which is also called the Texas Hill Country, and a few even in places like the Davis Mountains, which we have mountains up to seven thousand feet in Texas. People don't know that. Mm. Uh, out in that part of the world. So um, going back to just John Green's thoughts from years ago, if you look, our part of the state is where most of the reports are from. And there is a very rich history of reports. And to me, a really interesting element of it is that there seems to be a lot of diversity, even in East Texas, in terms of what people report that they're seeing, like um, in color, for example. Uh, people think of a Bigfoot. I think they think of this giant brown mm-hmm. humanoid ape-like thing, right? Um, what got me really into wanting to dig into the story as a journalist was someone telling me that they drove down Highway 87, very close to where my dear lease was at the time, and they saw a gray-colored Bigfoot. It said it was a Bigfoot, but it was like gray, like a dark gray crossing the road in front of the sign that said Nichols Creek. Now, this was before social media, right before social media ever hit. And, um, you know, a year later, someone else unrelated come told me that they saw a gray colored Bigfoot creature right by Nichols Creek in Newton County. Hmm. Wow. That's a pattern. Yeah. Well, my aunt on the property that we hunted on, which was about seven miles as a crow flies away, not very far, thought we were crazy for thinking there might be Bigfoot creatures. But she goes, you know, there was a guy spotlighting rabbits down by your stand before you got on this lease, and he saw a silver bear. And I went, silver bear? Okay. First off, bears are very rare coming into East Texas, and there are no silver bears. And she goes, yeah, he shined it with the light and it was squatted down. Then it stood up on two legs and looked at him. And then it walked on two legs across the Highline right away. <laughs> now that Highline right away is about 50 yards. So no bear is going to go on two legs across that. And it was a, so there's three gray reports in one, you know, seven square mile area over a course of about five years. And then in the book, I talk, there's even more. And then there's these reports of like these orangutan red colored ones, like a, you know, almost like an orangutan color. Uh, the Big Thicket National Preserve, my late friend, um, uh, Rob Riggs, who wrote a book about the wild man of East Texas, talked about this multiple people seeing this reddish colored one. And then you got people seeing the standard brown one. So that was interesting to me because if I were going to make up a Bigfoot story, and I was somebody back then. I'm not going to go. I saw a gray Bigfoot. I saw an orangutan red colored Bigfoot. I'd be like, make, you know, I would toe the line of what people had seen in the Pacific Northwest, you know. So to me, all those things added up and made it kind of interesting. Any um, variance in um, in height? What um, what are we talking? Eight, nine feet? Well, that's interesting. So uh, I, there was a a track that we found in California of all places, not in Texas. And it was a smaller track. And man, if somebody walked in that area in that place barefooted, I mean, I think they're asking for trouble. Right. And I had a research show me that couldn't be a big foot. It's too small. I'm like, pal, they're not born nine feet. My God, can you imagine the mom having to give birth to a nine footer? Um, so there are, many reports of people seeing different sizes. The, the, the one 
the final report I got of this grayish color one that I got was actually said it was about five and a half, six feet tall, the one they saw. And um, then I had uh, some people report seeing like juveniles, you know, smaller ones. I've had people say they saw seven footers. Um, people say they saw nine footers. So there seems to be a lot of variation. And, and to me, that's cool because if it's a species, there's going to be variance in height, you know? You know, there's, you know, there's little guys and then there's like, you know, Yao Ming or Wilt Chamberlain guys, you know, and then, you know, you got really little, really big. And so that all points to me to a species. And um, encounters in the uh, the piney forest in Texas. Um, Mm -hmm. I mean, any eyewitness accounts of uh, aggressive Bigfoot or are they more elusive? So the, so a long time ago did a national geographic special. And uh, I said the difference, cause you like Pacific Northwest Bigfoot. So people up there are like treating them like there's some kind of peace warriors of the forest, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, little hippie Bigfoots in a commune somewhere. And I'm like, <laughs> ours listen to black Sabbath and they're like metalhead raging, <laughs> raging Sasquatches, you know? So you have reports like the legend of Boggy Creek. There was a, uh, and a famous account that really happened of one that attacked a guy. The guy ended up in the hospital. Claims that's what attacked him. Um, other reports, I had one. Now, I consider a home invasion aggressive. Mm-hmm. Okay? So there's, I interviewed this lady, and she did not want to be on any, like, television show or whatever. I kept her name uh, quiet in the book. Um, and she told me a story when she was a young girl growing up in the early 1980s. She lived in this area of East Texas, and uh, they had a railroad track fairly close to her house, but they were out in the woods. And she came home one day, and the front door was open, and the kitchen was ransacked, and it smelled really bad. Now, back in the day, they thought it was a quote-unquote hobo from the train because they were fairly close to the tracks. Didn't seem like an animal would have done it the way it happened, and it, you know. Come, it happened a couple more times. It started scaring her, you know. Well, she comes home one day, and she had a long hallway in the front of the house. And they had one of those old school, like, live-in size attics, but it had the pull-down stairs. Mm-hmm. step go up, and it was pulled down. And the doors flung open. And she walk, as she's walking up to see, this thing is up in there and looks at her. And it trips. It falls down in front of her. And she said it stood up and looked at me. She's like five feet away. And I could see that it was looking right at the exit. And it shoved her out of the way against the wall and ran out the door. And uh, she was like, she called it a wild man, which is a very common name in East Mm -hmm. Texas, the wild man. But what she described was what people would call a Bigfoot creature. So um, that was one of the more interesting kind of aggressive accounts. Uh, There are multiple stories of people having rocks thrown at them. Uh, sticks thrown at them, stuff like that. There was one where a guy was camping in the back of his truck at a location and woke up with one about right here in his face. Wow. Yikes. Like bent, bent over looking at him, you know? And uh, so, you know, what got me into really wanting to do field research was a vocalization. You know, I've never had a visual encounter that was like mind blowing thing. But I had a couple of vocalizations that were heard. Um, and that's what starts the book off. If you get, go to BigfootSouth.com and get you, the first thing you'll read is this, these vocal encounters. And it was very intense. It was, uh, you know, and the second time I had heard it, I was, I'm now a young man. I was a kid the first time. Me and my dad heard it. My dad was with me when I heard it the second time. And we were on an investigation and we looked at each other and said, that's what we heard, you know, when we were kids. Now it was, we were on a, we had context for this now. And I had just been to Venezuela peacock bass fishing eight months earlier and had heard um, howler monkeys. Hmm. Yeah. And this thing sounded very howler monkey esque, but like someone injected a howler monkey with a lot of steroids and perhaps some other illicit substances. And it was going crazy. And I knew it was no known animal. It wasn't a monkey, but it was in that vein. And it behaved like the howler monkey did. Because for whatever reason, I was bored, kept hearing these howler monkeys in the trees. And one of the days, I just sat there and growled at the howler monkey. I went, and it stopped. 
And then it growled at me. And it, I growled twice and it growled twice. I growled three times. This howler monkey got really mad, growled, and started breaking branches and retreated out of the area. This thing did the exact same thing. For whatever reason, I decided to growl back at it and it stopped and growled. I did two, it did two. I did three, it went into a rage and then you could hear it snapping branches as it left. So that connected with me that number one, this was a real thing. It was physical and it was some kind of a primate. That's what got me into thinking this was a real phenomenon right there. I mean, I, I believe it probably was before, but you know, seeing wasn't believing for me, hearing was believing, you know? Chester Moore, the author of Bigfoot South, back with more of our conversation right after these. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete, unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is... I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So help me fight big tech censorship. Enjoy the complete unedited episodes and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there. Chester Moore is with us. The new, uh, well, it's the 20th anniversary edition of Bigfoot South, updated edition. And uh, Chester also, the uh, host of More Outdoors on News Talk AM 560 KLVI uh, in Beaumont, Texas. And uh, the host of Higher Calling Wildlife and Dark Outdoors podcast, editor in chief, Texas Fish and Game. Um, so. You must hear from, speaking of uh, fish and game, do you, do you mm -hmm. receive um, most of your Bigfoot sightings and so forth from uh, sport fishermen, hunters, or is it ranchers? Uh, it's a great, that's a great question. It's kind of a diverse group. Uh, I would say, because I don't solicit reports anymore. They just kind of come, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the number one group would be hunters. I would say the number one group's hunters. And the number two would probably be just motorist people seeing something cross the road. And then after that, I would probably say be like backcountry uh, campers, hikers. Those are the three main groups that I've heard of. And then just someone like maybe the owned a ranch or something and like, hey, I've lived here my whole life and then this happened, you know? So, but that's probably the main group, hunters being the top one, because hunters are very astute to what's in the woods, they understand game. They understand if something's out of place. They have a very great context for what's supposed to be there and what's not supposed to be there in terms of, you know, what's accepted wildlife. And so um, that's probably, a, a, and they're also in areas of the forest and woods. That a lot of people don't go, you know, they're not on a hiking trail necessarily. Um, they're in areas where people don't go and they, have, they spend a lot of time in the woods, you know. Um, I'm not sure which um, indigenous group is sort of, um, in that area, let's say the the, the Piney Woods, uh, would that be the, um, I don't know, the Apache or whomever, but did they there have- There is, uh, so there, the Alabama and the Cushada tribes uh, have a reservation together, the Alabama Cushada um, in near Livingston, Texas. And interestingly, um, their vocalization report that I gave you was probably 10 miles from there. Uh, but um, the Louisiana Choctaw, mm -hmm. you know, on the other side over there, had a name for a being they called an Elusa Fayala. 
and they call it the long evil being. Mm. And uh, some people have kind of like, you know, connected that with the, uh, with the Bigfoot phenomenon that it could be like a, you know, a tribal word back in the day for what they were encountering. But once again, if that is, we ain't got no hippie Bigfoots down here. And we got a few of them. They're a little bit nasty. You know, I think they're want to make mainly want to be left alone, but some of them are like, I'm not taking anything from you guys. I'm at least lobbing a stick at you, you know? <laughs> it's the true Texas spirit, right? <laughs> Leave go, me man. alone. I just want to be left alone. Exactly. Uh, Leave me alone. <laughs> but but do the, I mean, are the, uh, you mentioned the Choctaw Indians and, and um, some of the other um, mm. nations, do they share that information willingly or are they very reluctant to talk about it? You know, I just have nominal information on that. It's not something I really dug into, you know, but it's in some of the, you know, some of the traditions that I looked up and things like that, you know, and other people like Lauren Coleman, the yeah. author had done a little bit more on some of that, but I, I can't speak intelligently on that. So I don't want to screw it up. <laughs> just a little bit that I know. Okay. You mentioned the, um, the howler monkeys and so forth. Yeah. And um, I seem to recall years ago watching on TV, some of these, um, uh, in I think it was in Texas, there was these mm -hmm. uh, sort of primate rescue um, mm -hmm. places in Texas where mm -hmm. they would take, I don't know, maybe um, chimpanzees from a circus or a zoo or uh, that were pets and they would, you know, try and rehabilitate them and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, talk to me about the, about the sort of the escaped monkey and ape hypothesis. Yeah, thank you for that. I'm speaking this weekend at my friend Craig Woolheater's Falk Monster Festival. And I'm speaking on feral apes and primates, you know, just in general, feral primates, you know. And it, the first story I ever heard of this, I was a young wildlife journalist, bow hunting, doing an article about bow hunting hogs in South Texas. And uh, the, the guide at this particular ranch told me that a buddy of his was in a little ground hunting blind in this place in South Texas on a, on a creek bottom. And before daylight, he heard the worst sound he ever heard in his life. And something was coming toward him, getting closer. He was getting terrified. He'd never heard anything like this. And right before daylight, a little hairy hand reached inside the blind. Mm -hmm. And he exits the blind, <laughs> turns around with a flashlight, and there's a monkey. It was, a, it was they called him snow monkeys, a Japanese macaque. Mm, oh, yes. Around the town of centered around Dilly, which is south of San Antonio, Texas. There was a primate facility that took in Japanese macaques from Japan, like literally from the wild in Japan that were like problem animals, like around cities or something. And they adapted. And there is a feral population of them in South Texas, which is interesting because these are the monkeys you'll see pictures of like in hot springs at Mount Fuji. Yeah, with it's the red cold. faces. Yeah, snow monkeys. Yeah. They're living in South Texas where it's 105 degrees 50 days a year, you know, uh, and they've adapted pretty well. And there's definitely a feral population of them down there. And someone heard, you know, how many people had heard that same thing and didn't know what it was, you know, or saw something in the distance. And in Florida, there are rhesus monkey populations in three different locations that I'm aware of that are verified rhesus monkey populations. But when I started digging into Bigfoot South, the chapter I added for this 20th anniversary edition was about the feral apes and monkey because there are things connected to the Bigfoot phenomenon that don't match like your traditional Bigfoot more ape-like, more monkey-like, you know? And there were places in Florida up until like the 80s that had not only like monkeys, lowland gorillas, chimpanzees, orangutans. And the rhesus monkey population in the one area came from one of these places in a big escape a long time ago. So if rhesus monkeys got out, could it have been chimps that got out? Could orangutans have got out? And orangutans can live to be like 70 years old, mm -hmm. you know? Could there have been a breeding pair or two or multiple ones that got out? Look, if you're a facility like this and your monkeys get out, you might report that. I'm not sure how many back in the day would report apes running around, you know, a public threat. You know what I mean? Right. So there is, there's a famous uh, photo connected to the Bigfoot phenomenon called the Mayaka ape. And uh, Lauren Coleman 
I always try to give credit where credit's due, right? He's the one who kind of found out about this first. It was actually photos sent anonymously to a police department. And someone thought someone's orangutan had got loose because it kept taking food off her porch. And she snapped two pictures. This woman, she was a woman, snapped two pictures. And we still don't know who it was, but she sent to the, Lauren Coleman got all the pictures and they're published. And it looks orangutanish. It looks kind of not orangutanish, but the face. So could there have been some kind of a, a breeding population of these things out there? You know, Lance Rozier, the Big Thicket National Preserve is probably East Texas' most famous Bigfoot area. Mm -hmm. And Lance Rozier, there's a unit of that preserve named after this guy. He was a naturalist. He wrote, my friend Michael Mays tipped me off to this, it's some old documents. He wrote that someone found a baboon carcass in the Big Thicket, and he went and looked at the baboon carcass. So there's a lot of these stories of these feral. We know there's established feral monkeys in Texas and Florida. There's an island off the coast of South Carolina that has a couple of thousand rhesus monkeys. That's a government weird facility where they like harvest them annually to bring in. It's weird. And so we have established that primates from other nations can thrive in America. So if you had some escapes, maybe they thrive to a point where some of these where Bigfoot reports maybe aren't Bigfoot. Maybe they're a feral chimp or a feral orangutan, something like that. So that's something to, to kind of file in the X-Files there. Right. Although, I mean, pretty hard to confuse a rhesus monkey or even a macaque with a, <laughs> with a Bigfoot. Um, no, but, but, but the vocalizations, the maybe the vocalizations the Bigfoot yeah. thing isn't just sightings, right? A lot of it's vocalizations yeah. and stuff like that. That's people true. Report hearing. So I got to file that in there, you know, that some of these things people, cause people see so much Bigfoot media on, so on like YouTube and to television and everything else. They hear all these sounds that are played. They're allegedly Bigfoot creatures. And then all of a sudden some people, anything odd they hear becomes a Bigfoot, you know? So if they are out camping in Florida and not aware and they hear a rhesus monkey, it might be a Bigfoot. I mean, I've heard YouTube videos that were obviously feral hogs, <laughs> obviously feral hogs, and they were Bigfoots. You know, like even something completely different, elk have been restored thanks to the efforts of hunter conservationists in the eastern U.S., like they were originally indigenous to all the states, but now we've got huntable elk populations in Kentucky and Tennessee and North Carolina, Pennsylvania and Virginia. A lot of people aren't even still aware of that. If you've never heard an elk before and you're camping in the back country and a bull comes out at night and the rut and bugles behind your tent, mm -hmm. you might think it's a Sasquatch. So I'm always trying to educate people about like known wildlife and some of these exotics. That way they can kind of eliminate what they have seen or heard or experienced and they may you know, they may be, they may not, they may not be experiencing a Bigfoot, but they still might be experiencing something a little bit rare, you know, always trying to educate people about what's known out there, you know, as well. Right. Any reports of, um, a Bigfoot taking game, um, like, a, a wild hog or. Oh yes. Yeah. I investigated a hog taking. Now it wasn't reported as a Bigfoot. Huh. It was reported as a mountain lion and there are mountain lions in my region, but they're very rare. And I went there, and, and this was a long time ago, and um, they had a police line. Like, what happened was people around here catch feral hogs, mm -hmm. and they'll bring them to a pen, feed them corn for a month or two, fatten them up, and, and butcher them. Somebody had done this, and they had these hogs in this old horse pen. And allegedly a mountain lion got came there and got one. So I get there, and it's a horse pen that's like five feet tall with white picket fence. And I said, where, you know, I'm walking around this thing with this guy and I'm like, where did the mountain lion come in and out or whatever, drag the hog over? And I'm like, well, I think it's over by this side. And I'm like, there's no blood, there's no mud. If a mountain lion attacks a hog, there's gonna be blood everywhere, mm -hmm. right? There was no blood. And, and, and I look and there's like two or three hogs in there. I said, in comparison to the size hogs in here, how big was the one they got taken? It was bigger. So I'm thinking 150 pound pig. Cause these are probably the biggest, probably about 120, 130. So say 150 pound pig. And I said, well, and I had a police line. We found, this is where they found the mountain lion tracks and there's a police tape. They literally, the sheriff's department <laughs> guy put like police tape. And I'm going, and I said, where's the mountain lion tracks? He goes, there they are. I said, dude, those are dog tracks. Those are the large canine. And there's a German shepherd running around the ranch. Mm -hmm. And I'm watching them going, oh, okay. I got, they just, they thought it was a mountain lion. 
I said, so I'm going to, I said, where did, he said, we found half the body down by the, by the creek, half the body. He goes, yeah, the mountain lion ripped the thing in half. And I'm going, brother, this is spot on. And I'm like going, so I said, if this cat went inside there and it can easily get in there, it can't, it's going to have to, I don't think it could get a 150 pound hog over that fence. No. If it did, it would have to climb with it. There'd be mud and blood all over. Something went in there and grabbed it and got out with it. So I'm thinking, I don't know, this is weird. Is someone playing a prank on me? What's going on? And I said, he goes, yeah, you can, I said, it would be drag marks. And, and there wasn't one drag mark, but there were drops of blood, little drops of blood and no mud all over a trail to half of a body. That was the front half. Interestingly, the meaty half had been taken. Mm -hmm. And then there ended up being some tracks found on the backside or it was travel corridor. So, and I've heard of uh, several people, you know, talking about seeing take animals. And I've heard a report of someone seeing, they said they saw one carrying a deer. Yep. Carrying a deer over its shoulder. So there's a lot of, a lot of stuff like that out there. And, you know, as a as an i'm not trying to change the world with bigfoot um, it's not the most important thing in the world it's cool i like the fact that you can promote wildlife conservation through saying hey habitat's important you know this is kind of one of the reasons i do it but i look at it as a journalist what is the story you know what is what is, what are we looking at here and when you started asking people questions 20 years ago i believed them more because there wasn't all this information out there. Right, right. So now someone has seen every Bigfoot show ever produced and every mm -hmm. bad YouTube series ever produced. And they give you, they don't, they didn't just see a Bigfoot. They add everything else that was in the woods adds, I found a limb break, I found a limb twist, I found this. And I'm like, okay. So it's a little harder to sift through. You know what I like? You know what I like, um, Richard? I like this. I saw something really strange in the woods. And can you help me understand what I saw? And I just and and I'll just, and I'll never say what did the Bigfoot look like. I'm mm -hmm. like, what did you see? What did you see? And then they'll tell me they saw this, and they'll I'll walk them through it. Because you know, as an interviewer, as a journalist yourself, you know, you could lead people if you want to. Of course, you know, of course, it's pretty easy to do. We even do it unintentionally, I think, sometimes just in conversation. You know, um, so I always try to leave it very open. And that's where you get some of those neat ones. Like, well, I didn't want to add this part because it sounded really weird, but it was carrying a deer over its shoulder. You know, it was like, please don't tell anybody. I like that because to me that adds credibility. They're not trying to be a social media star. You know? I agree. Uh, you know, I think the ufology has fallen victim to that as well. We have an expression up here in Canada. Um, it's mm -hmm. getting too far out over our skis. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. you know, it became, you know, we went from, well, what are those strange lights in the skies to, you know, um, secret moon bases and, and things like that. Yeah. So I think, yeah, the, it's, it's the same thing can be true uh, in mm -hmm. cryptozoology. However, yep. you can have, you know, two things being true at the same time. You can have people you can. misidentifying you, you can. and you can have the real creature. Mm -hmm. For Just, sure. Chester Moore is with us, and the 20th anniversary of Bigfoot South is now available. For more information, go to BigfootSouth.com. Another quick timeout, back with more of our conversation. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So, Help me fight big tech censorship, enjoy the complete unedited episodes, and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there.
Chester Moore is with us. I want to ask you about, uh, you have a, um, uh, a program for children with special challenges and you take them out on mm -hmm. Bigfoot mm -hmm. expeditions. Uh, I mean, this has mm -hmm. got to be the only one in the world. This is a very, a very <laughs> unique program. Tell me about it. Well, you know, uh, the overall mission, or our mission is to bring the love of Christ to hurting kids through wildlife encounters. I have a little zoologic facility and kids that have terminal illness, critical illness, parental loss, sibling loss. We've even worked with girls that have been through sex trafficking. We take them to meet exotic. They like animals. They get to experience exotic animals. If they have a specific animal they want to meet, we take them. So we took kids this week into a bear encounter, you know. But the th we, we have a program called Wild Wishes. That's what the program's called. The third one was a kid wanted to have a Bigfoot expedition. <laughs> and I had done a lot of Bigfoot TV, and he had seen an episode I did in the Big Thicket, so we took him out there on the episode. And, uh, and I'm like, man, if we can just get one, like, distant call or something, you can't make this stuff happen, you know? Like, it would be awesome. And as soon as we got there, got dark, and I let out a call, and something answered back. You couldn't tell what it was, but it was high pitch, way off, and the kid was ecstatic. Mm. I'm like, okay, that's cool. Well, on the way out, it's a long drive in there in the preserve. And uh, I said, uh, okay, I'll stop at three locations where we head out and hit the highway and call out. I did. Nothing happened. I forgot about the third stop. My dad goes, hey, you promised three stops. I'll hit the brakes. <laughs> I'll pull out. We all get out. And I let out this call. And it called back at us. It couldn't have been 30 or 40 yards in the woods. People are jumping in their cars, the families. And this little kid's standing next to me going, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. So we have done multiple. Now we, we, this one thing we do ask, if you have a kid facing a challenge of us, Bigfoot, if we can make it happen, we'll take him on an expedition. We're going to go out and use thermal imagery. We're going to take him into area of high activity. We're going to teach him about wildlife and wildlife conservation while we're there. We're going to give him a gift package that includes, you know, Bigfoot track castings, books and stuff. And even like this weekend at the Fountain Monster Fest, my friend Craig Woolheater at both this and the Texas Bigfoot Conference he hosts, he allows us to bring our families in free of charge. So we always bring a family in that loves Bigfoot. They get to go experience at conferences. Friends like Lyle Blackburn and Shelly Covington, Montana, have helped me host kids out in the woods. We took a trip of nine kids to Boggy Creek at Falk, Arkansas, and did a Bigfoot expedition with those two. So here's what happens, my friend. We love kids, me and my wife do, and... When a kid or anyone goes through a tragedy or a bad health diagnosis or an abuse issue, in our minds, life never gets better than the day before that happens. We always mm. think there's a dark cloud, and maybe there is. We want to let them know that good things can still happen in their life, and that's why we do it. That even something crazy might have happened, their wildest dream could still come true, you know? And uh, we had a family, and I we haven't we adopted our daughter, and we supported adoption and foster of kids. And this family adopted four, uh, four kids out of foster, teen kids, ain't easy. And they did a Bigfoot expedition with us. I went to two locations here in East Texas when we last September in 2023, and uh, I let the kids have the thermal. And uh, this kid sitting there looking through this thermal, he goes, there's something looking up behind the tree at us. <laughs> and they all looked, they saw something. They were freaking out. And then they had a stick thrown at us through the you know, bushes and the woods. And it's all about creating those moments. So if a family, you know, has a kid that's gone through something and really loves Bigfoot, reach out to us. You can email me at Chester at Chestermore.com or go to BigfootSouth.com and hit the email link. Contact me. You know, we might not always be able to make an expedition happen where you're at, maybe in Canada. That might be a little hard for us, although I'll try. Um, <laughs> but we'll send them a bunch of Bigfoot books and plaster castings and let them know that they're loved out there. Oh, God bless you. That's um, <clears throat> that's wonderful. And just, you know, whether you see, as you say, whether you see Bigfoot or not, it just yeah. being outdoors in the fresh yeah. air or sleeping under the stars, you know, that's a cure all for a lot of things. It is, but it does it for me, you know, like I like to fly fish and stuff and I just take my fly rod and go explore somewhere if I had a really crappy week and it just makes me feel better. So you know, look, I could always filter things through what, what little Chester would have liked because I haven't really changed that much. I mean, I'm still a big kid and I'm like, dude, if, if, if I had somebody to offer me that, I, I thought that was like impossible to go do almost, you know, so like something like that. Mm -hmm. So. That's always my thing. And uh, yeah, we got a family coming to the Fountain Monster Festival this weekend. And uh, yeah, it's fun, man. Thank you for asking about that. That's a, that's a passion of my heart. And 
uh, you know, we've started a thing called the Global Bigfoot Society. You can get in from on that at globalbigfoot.com. And it's just going to be exclusive newsletter, membership, blog, uh, cool merchandise. And every time someone joins, I'm giving a membership and all the decals and the merchandise to a kid. So you get your stuff, and then we donate one to a kid in our program. Yeah, wonderful. And uh, so we do that, too. And uh, it's fun, man, because, look, at the end of the day, this is all like playing Scooby-Doo. OK, <laughs> so, you know, we're running around the Mr. Machine looking for monsters, brother. <laughs> exactly. Hey, that's a that's a wonderful <laughs> calling. Um, I mentioned sleeping under the stars. Yeah, man. Would you sleep under the stars in the, in the big thicket without a without a weapon? I don't go to Walmart without a weapon. I'm in Texas. Uh, so it's probably more dangerous. No. Yeah. The answer is no. And here's the other reason. I have a podcast called Dark Outdoors, and it explores dangers in the wild, mainly human dangers in mm. the wild. Okay. So I, I'm coming back to see my family, and whatever is trying to prevent me from doing that, you know, if it's got to be dealt with, it will be. And so the answer is no. Like I said, I don't go anywhere without a firearm. I'm a Texan. Uh, so no. Uh, if, if from, for fear of Bigfoot, um, there is the unknown thing, you know, but I've been out in the woods many times and by myself, you know, but, uh, no, I'm going arm, brother. I'm just, I'm sticking with the second amendment while we have it. Um, <laughs> uh, he goes, us- that is the most redneck answer I've ever had in the history of my television program. I mean, my, my, my podcast. <laughs> That's not redneck. <laughs> That's just pure Americana. Um, <laughs> there you go. You, uh, you were a child at the South Texas State Fair, oh, and yeah. uh, what happened? It involved Bigfoot, I'm told. Yeah, so I've always, look, I was born loving nature. I mean, my whole life I've been obsessed with wildlife, hunting, fishing, wildlife, photography, you name it. And the Bigfoot thing was on my radar four or five years old. I actually have a scrapbook. It's actually a picture of it in the book where I was taking little newspaper clippings that would come across a Bigfoot and put them in a scrapbook when I was a little kid, right? So I've always been into it. South Texas State Fair, I can't peg down the exact year. It was 83 or 84, right in there. Um, there was this giant big trailer display, very nice, and it had a Bigfoot body. Is this the body of a Bigfoot, Sasquatch? So my mom, my mom like tells the story. I went like, she said, you went at least five times that night. I couldn't get you on the rides. You kept going, let's go back and look at the Bigfoot. You know, I was like 10, 11, maybe. And there was this very nice display, a very nice glass case. And there were actually pictures. This is like in the eighties, big posters, like on metal printed out of like the Patterson Gimlin images. So mm-hmm. they had spent some money on this and there was this thing in a glass case. Um, now, there was a fake Bigfoot that was put out about 10 years ago now. Yeah, I remember that, yeah. It was horrible. It was basically, it was a Chewbacca costume put in ice. That's what it was. It was a freaking Chewbacca costume. And uh, if this was a fake, it was radically better. Um, it looked weird. My, I kept going back and going, that can't be real, but maybe it is. You know what I mean? And like, the, the, what I remember about it is number one, it was it caught me as a kid. It, it was a male, and it had male genitalia. They mounted male genitalia on it. That was interesting. Um, the face didn't look like what I would think if I were to make up a Bigfoot. It had a little rounder face, and the eyes were really sunk in deep. I remember very deep round eyes, and a very round face. And it was probably a very good makeup artist creative fake. Right. But maybe it wasn't Um, because the other fakes I had seen and different things didn't look quite as good as this did, you know? So um, if anyone was in Texas or in the South in the eighties and saw a Bigfoot carcass at a fair carnival or something like that, please reach out to me. I would love to know who owned it. Mm -hmm. If it still exists Um, or anybody that might have photos, you couldn't take photos like these days, we just snuck in a camera. We just snuck in our cell phones, right, and got pictures. Exactly. You know, but couldn't do that back then, you know. But that was that had made a big impression on me. I actually, quote my mom in the book. What did you remember about it? I remembered you being like obsessed with going back to it, and she remembered it looking. She kind of thought, "Look, it's probably not real, but if they if it's not, they spent money on it. It wasn't just some 
you know, cheapo depot thing. You know, it was something that was there. So I, I know that I saw it. Thousands of other people saw it that weekend. And it wasn't, I guarantee you that wasn't the only place it was taken. So trying to find the history of that, if it's real, that would be awesome if it's still out there. And if it's not, I'd still like to go look at it, you know, check it out. It's part of history. Well, I would, I don't, is the South Texas State Fair around? Is it the original? Yeah. And what they do is they have different carnival vendors and stuff come in. You know, so uh, maybe there's I'm a paper trail. Go to the, maybe there's yeah, a paper I'm going to go trail. back to the organization that runs it in the next couple of months. I've been real busy right now and go back and see if there is paperwork for like, say, 82 to 84 to cover that whole little stretch right there. Right. And see whatever. But it was only we went every year and that was the only year it was there it was the one year that you know we saw it. So if I can find that thing out, um, uh, it's, it's, it's just a mystery. It's an intriguing thing to me. So that's, that's new for my book. this year. Uh, me too. And I wasn't there. I would love to hear the result of that yeah. investigation. Jester, great to meet you. This is uh, you, brother. a lot of fun. And, um, you know, more importantly, perhaps, uh, th- you know, this whole interest in Bigfoot, as you were pointing out, generates a lot of interest in wildlife conservation. So mm-hmm. it's a win-win. Yeah. Yeah, man, I'm doing a project called Wild Man of the Woods. I'm the narrator for a friend of mine, Paul Fazinski, who does a great, you can go to Wild Man of the Woods YouTube channel, high level Bigfoot documentary interviews, Wild Man of the Woods. And the whole mission of that is to engage people into wildlife conservation and make them respect habitat. You know, we may never solve this mystery, but we're definitely not going to solve it if we mow down every acre out there, you know. Bigfoot South, the 20th anniversary edition bigfootsouth.com the links are in the episode notes chester great to meet you thank you you too richard thank you man hi there if you want to watch the rest of these episodes please head over to my rumble channel richard Serrett's strange planet you can watch complete episodes there new complete unedited episodes drop every monday wednesday and friday again the rumble channel is richard Serrett's strange planet in the meantime i want to thank you for supporting this youtube channel all of these years however the problem is i never know when i'm going to run afoul of the censors at youtube i never know when i'm going to end up in youtube jail there doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason and in fact two more strikes and this youtube channel will be taken down altogether so Help me fight big tech censorship, enjoy the complete unedited episodes, and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there. Hello once again, friends. Welcome to another episode of Strange Planet, and it is a far stranger planet than we can possibly imagine. On this episode, demystifying death with a hospice nurse. But before we get into that, just a friendly reminder, if you'd like to get a little deeper into Strange Planet, you might want to consider becoming a premium subscriber. You gain access to commercial-free listening, bonus episodes, two per month, produced exclusively for premium subscribers, and you also receive my monthly newsletter, Inner Sanctum. Just go to the link in the episode notes, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm. All right. Uh, about 10 months ago, a little more than 10 months ago, my mother passed away in hospice at the age of 98. Uh, she had a beautiful life and I like to think a beautiful death, uh, which makes it uh, a lot easier, that transition, I think, for both of us. Um, and we're going to get into that right now. Demystifying death to live more fully. Nothing to fear with uh Julie McFadden, she's a registered nurse. She's known as Hospice Nurse Julie, and uh, or she's also in palliative care. She has more than 15 years of experience. She's passionate about normalizing death and dying. She has more than 1 million followers on TikTok uh, as at, uh, at Hospice Nurse Julie. The link is in the episode notes. She's been featured in Newsweek, USA Today, The Atlantic, Business Insider, The Patient Story, many other media news or many media outlets worldwide. 
and uh, we're happy to have Nurse Julie on the program, Strange Planet. Welcome. How are you? Thank you. So nice to be here. I'm good. I'm good. Was that your, your career path from the outset? You, you decided when you became a nurse, I'm going to get into palliative and, and hospice uh, care, or was or did that happen afterwards? No, that happened afterwards. I was an ICU nurse for many years, and I thought I would go back to school to become a nurse practitioner, maybe get into anesthesia or something, and that's not what happened. After a few years in the ICU is what made me become passionate about at least changing my career to be a hospice nurse and palliative care nurse, but mostly hospice. Um, and then I just sort of took the plunge, just sort of changed, hoping I'd like it. And turns out I did. I love it. And um, death to me is really, you know, it's the number one topic. It's uh, and, and topics around death, you know, uh, what happens when we die, the moment of death, what happens after, where do we go? Can we communicate with people who've passed on and so forth? Um, and eventually it's a reality that, you know, it leaves nobody untouched. Nobody gets out of here alive. We all end up losing people we love. That's the cost of, of love really is, is death. Um, so when you decide to write a book about demystifying death, to live more fully, what does that mean to live more fully by demystifying it? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. Thank you, by the way. Um, I don't get asked that often. So what I saw as a hospice nurse, I've been a hospice nurse for about eight years now. And one of the main things that made me want to start doing things on social media, which turned into a book now, was to tell people that what I witnessed with other dying people is that the ones that were willing to basically look at their own mortality, accept it ish, you don't even have to fully accept it, but at least be willing to look at it and and believe that it's coming and happening and prepare for it and talk about it. Um, even if talking about it is like a negative way, like I don't want it to happen. But those patients that did that seem to die more peacefully and live better during that time that they had left. So they were living better and dying better. So to me, it's like demystifying death. So learning about death, accepting death, understanding death, thinking about your own mortality seems to help you live better. And then I think because you're living better, you die better, meaning a little more peaceful. Because the ones that weren't doing that did did seem to struggle a little more, uh, whether it's existentially, but then because it's existential, they still carried physical symptoms, agitation, hanging on a little longer, more pain, struggling more. So that's what I mean by that. I really believe that that can translate to everyone's lives. Because like you said, we're all dying. We're all dying. So I think if we all can come to grips with that or not even come to grips with it, just talk about it, just just think about it a little bit it actually will help us live better and die better i think do you look at um not only the, the 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 patient that's getting ready to pass on as a patient and we tend to forget you know their patients right up until they draw their last breath um yeah. they're not just someone who needs to be you know pushed to one corner and we just wait you know uh their patients uh mm -hmm. but you also look at the at the the, the family at bedside as as patients sort of in a way as well? Oh, definitely. I mean, the whole hospice team, if we're just talking palliative too, but hospice as well, uh, the team, me, the nurse, social worker, home health aide, doctor, chaplain, all of us are treating the family, I think. So mm -hmm. not just the patient, but the family, or not even family, anyone who's around that patient caring for them, whether it's friends, family, whoever, care, paid caregivers, they're all part of it. And um, I definitely, when I'm doing hospice admissions where like people are coming onto service and I'm educating, I always try to make sure whoever's going to be there caring for that person is at that first visit at least so they can really be a part of it. Right. When my mother was in hospice and it was literally like a five minute drive from where I grew up, where she, she lived since 1956, uh, it, was the, it was like a five star hotel. Uh, and I thought to myself, wow, this is the way I want to go. Um, but let's talk about the anxiety that people have. Um, not, not the person who's dying. I mean, we'll talk about that person as well, but the people that are, that are at bedside and are very anxious and very worried that their loved one is, is suffering. 
Uh, they mm. see certain th- uh, things, they hear certain things. It, it gives them anxiety because, oh, they're, they're in distress, they're suffering. Just kind of walk us through some of these things uh, and, and disabuse us of the notion that, you know, that there's something unusual going on here with a, with a dying person. Yeah. Our society had done a really bad job, at, a really good job, actually, at hiding death from us mm. and then showing, showing a version of death on TV or the movies that is not real. You know, the person gives some big monologue and then they close their eyes and they like just die. And that's just not how it happens. I mean, maybe every one in 100 does that happen. And that's still kind of often, but the majority of people dying um, go through the same thing. So it's a phase called actively dying. It's a, it's a, the last phase of life. And no one is used to seeing it. Even other healthcare workers, even other people. When I was an ICU nurse, I never saw what it looked like when someone was actively dying. Because in the ICU, when someone was like taken off machines, it usually happened much quicker, the death. So you didn't see this like process. Whereas when you're dying a natural death, it's from something, but you're naturally allowing it to happen. You go through this process. And people who are not used to seeing it will always, oh, not always, but mostly always will associate with with what they're seeing with suffering. And it's not. So everything that you see at the end of life, let most people at the end of life will be unconscious, usually yeah. not waking up. Their eyes and mouths might be open. And that's because the full body is relaxing. All those muscles are releasing and it takes muscles to close your mouth and to close your eyes. So people aren't used to seeing that. So they see their loved ones with this weird look on their face, right? And kind of no one home in their eyes. That can be alarming, but that's a really natural process that naturally happens. Or the silent scream. Tell us about that. Silent scream, yes. So so our bodies are metabolically, physiologically shutting down systematically. While that's happening, their their consciousness, the, the thing that kind of their essence that makes them them, right, is is likely not there. How do we know that? Because they're not really responding to us. You can kind of see their eyes. They're they're fixed. They're not looking at us. They're not interacting. But they're still making these strange faces or a silent scream. Their mouth is gaping open. Their eyes are wide open. Those are no, that doesn't always happen, by the way, like the whole like silent scream where they look like they're screaming, but nothing's coming out. That doesn't always happen, but I like to talk about it because it happens enough that it makes people think, oh, my God, the last the last their last moment, they looked like they were screaming. Right. Well, they, where were they going? What was happening? And it's truly like a biological response to the body because it's just a bo- a full body let go, a full body. Just everything is releasing. So their muscles are fully relaxed, fully releasing. So their mouth's hanging open. Their eyes could almost fly open like they're scared. But really it's just because the muscles are releasing and it takes muscles to keep our eyes closed. So there's all these biological things that happen that are very natural that people don't know that. So they just, they put emotion to it because it's easy to, because it's their loved one and they want to try to understand it. So they're, they're trying to think of reasons why, and really there are usually biological reasons why usually like the changes in breathing, almost everyone will breathe differently at the end of life. People will always look at that and think that their loved one is suffocating or trying to breathe, but they can't, but that's really not what's happening. What's happening is our body, our bodies are metabolically shutting down and it changes your blood chemistry. And because it changes your blood chemistry, it makes you breathe different. So again, the person's likely unconscious and the body is systematically shutting down. So it changes the way we breathe to basically help us die. But the breathing can look like uh, people will describe it as like guppy breathing or gasping the for death, air. The death rattle. Or- yeah, the death rattle, that's also something that happens that's also different. So the death rattle is, uh, we call it terminal secretions. That's the that's the actual name. And that can be very minuscule amounts of saliva. So you and I are sitting here, our body's automatically making saliva to keep our mouth moist. And then our body is, when healthy, automatically swallow all that saliva. I just did it without trying. Um when we're dying, that stops. So the body keeps creating moisture in the mouth, which is good because the, the body knows, hey, dry mouth is uncomfortable. So yeah. we're gonna make a lot of moisture. But then the body doesn't swallow the secretions. So it sits in the mouth. 
Yeah. That takes a lot of effort to swallow. I mean, we don't think about it, but when you have to think about it, I mean, it's very complicated. The, the, yes, it's the whole, very complicated. Yeah. And there's tons of muscles in the neck to make sure it goes down the esophagus and not down your trachea mm-hmm. to the lung. So there's all these things that, again, at the end of life are relaxing. All of them are relaxing. That's why people, um, so it's really hard to swallow and the brain's kind of cut off. Like the brain's not really automatically making you do things anymore. Right. So that little bit of saliva can collect in the mouth. And then again, your mouth breathing because your mouth's hanging open because it takes muscles to, to close your mouth that are relaxed now. So your mouth's hanging open and your, your breath is going over that secretion. So it's creating this loud, awful gurgling noise. And if you don't know what it is, families automatically are like, it's coming from their lungs, they're, they're drowning, they're suffocating. And uh, it's just not true. And it was just so surprising to me how no one knows, like no one talks to people about this. Everyone, almost everyone's going to, well, everyone's going to die, but almost everyone's going to have at least one or two experiences of a loved one on hospice or they're on hospice. Yeah. No one knows about any of this until it's happening in the moment. And even then, sometimes they don't get the education they need to know that like their loved one isn't suffering. So hence my hospice nurse Julie was born (laughs) and my book was born because I want people to know before it happens so they can, um, so they can spend that time with their loved one who's dying those last few days, few moments, few weeks, whatever, not in total fear. It's still normal to have some fear and it's still just uncomfortable and sad and all of the things, but at least you know what's happening. So you don't, feel like that surge of anxiety the whole time. Demystifying death to live more fully, nothing to fear. Julie McFadden, hospice nurse. Julie, back with more of our conversation right after these. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete, unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So, Help me fight big tech censorship, enjoy the complete unedited episodes, and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there. Julie McFadden, registered nurse, hospice nurse Julie, demystifying death to live more fully, nothing to fear. Um, it may sound strange, but I mean, I'm kind of, I'm excited about, you know, the part that comes after death, not the actual physical death, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm excited and I like to think I'm ready, hopefully. I've got a ways, I'm not in any rush. You know, I've, hopefully I've got my mother's genes. She lived to be 98. Um, but there, I, my greatest fear, and I think you've kind of assuaged that, is I'm incredibly claustrophobic. If I have mm-hmm. a blanket to a pie over my head, I actually start to panic. And my greatest fear is struggling for breath. I've had kind of, uh, you know, quasi asthmatic attacks, allergic to cats. And that fear of struggling for breath, even just a little, terrifies me. So can you assuage my fears further that when, when we pass, I'm not going to be struggling for death or for breath rather? Yes, yes, yes. I can help. I can help you with that. <laughs> and I really mean it. Anyone listening, because that's a common fear of I don't want to feel like I'm suffocating to death or I'm afraid. Now, that is that can be a symptom of end of life, uh, but not always, to be honest. It's only, certain diseases and stuff give you some shortness of breath or the feeling of air hunger. Hmm. So, but not everyone. Not everyone. It's definitely not like when you die, that's the feeling you have. That's definitely not happening. 
uh, some diseases can make you feel like that. But I can, so one, hospice, Hospice is an expert, you know, expert at managing symptoms. And the feeling of air hunger and shortness of breath is something we're great at managing. And it's pretty easy to manage with uh, a little bit of morphine. Specifically, if you, um, now, if you don't have any kind of like lung disease, like COPD, even people with COPD who truly have, you know, like um, non-functioning lungs, we can still help their shortness of breath. It just takes a lot of medication. But anyone, just anyone dying at the end of life is not feeling shortness of breath when they're having those changes of breathing. That's not what's happening. You you are fully unconscious. And um, when you're having those changes in breathing, your body is not feeling short of breath. Uh, if anything, it's like, um, and well, actually, let me answer how we know that. Because people will say, well, how do you know? No one, they can't tell you. We know because we can do... Uh, there's nonverbal scales we can look at to see how the body is responding. And, and almost everybody in the actively dying phase when they're breathing like that is showing no signs of discomfort. Because I know as a healthcare professional, when someone can't breathe or feels like they can't breathe, you're gonna know. A dying body is like a baby. If a baby is having trouble breathing or, having a, or has a fever or is uh, sick, the baby will let you know through cries, through being restless, fussy, a dying body will do the same. If it's not okay, it's going to show you physically. Um, and during the actively dying phase, I almost never see that happening because we're kind of shut off. The 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 part of us that that um, that would would uh, kind of be present in all of it seems to be shut off because they're not responding to much. So I think it's truly just the body physically shutting down. And if anyone was having shortness of breath or you were feeling that um, there uh, like a little bit of morphine goes a long way. I'm telling you, it relaxes your central nervous system. It relaxes your diaphragm and kind of gives you that feeling. Even, so we can help with Richard. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Listening. Thank you. Uh, even yeah. in the absence of morphine and medication, um, the body is the, the dying body releasing, um, uh, certain chemicals, uh, because people talk about, you know, this euf euphoric feeling they have to, they often have near the end. What's happening there? Yeah. So you can die without any medications. So people need medications for death because of the disease they're dying from. So particularly, I don't know what happened with your mother. So I, I guess I shouldn't say that, but usually people who are like 98 and they're, they're dying of like cardiac stuff or, you know, it's like they're basically dying because they live till 98 mm -hmm. or hundred. Usually, I mean, we don't have to give people medication at all because our bodies have built in mechanisms to help us die. So we shut off, the brain will shut off hunger and thirst. So they're not hungry. They're not thirsty. Calcium levels rise. So you just sleep all the time. Um, and then because of that, you're not eating and drinking, not eating and drinking. Your body usually will go into something called ketosis, which Everyone knows about ketosis because of the diet. So yeah. diet's a little different because you're still eating certain types of food. You make your body go into ketosis. This is different because you're not eating and drinking at all. But your body will go into ketosis. Ketosis dulls the nerves like the, for pain and then releases, um, uh, for lack of a better word, like endorphins yeah. to feel good. So dying people, when in ketosis, if they can get there, which doesn't always happen, Usually it happens a lot with the natural death. In hospitals, it's pretty tough because we're popping people full of fluid and stuff and doing mm. things. But a natural death, you'd go into ketosis. And um, yeah, endorphins release, pains dulled, and um, your body, we are built to die. I always say that. Our bodies are literally built to die. Oh, isn't that interesting? We're built to die. Just tell, mm. Talk to me more about that just that i mean we're built right our bodies somehow know how to survive the birth canal if we if we're born that way right unless if there's a sincere uh, a c-section but we're, our bodies are built to like know how to do it um and know how to grow and we're you know my heart's beating my lungs are breathing without me doing anything my body's just built to do it and it's the same with dying there are literal built-in mechanisms to help us die 
And I see it all the time on hospice. I did not see it in the hospital. And I'm not saying hospitals are bad, but because we're doing so many interventions, our body is not our body is not kicking in its natural mechanisms to do things. But once we allow, if we allow the natural process to take over when we're dying, the body has built in mechanisms to help us do it. We're literally built to do it. Like I said, so like, for instance, it'll shut the brain will shut off hunger and thirst mechanisms because the body knows the more dehydrated you are, the better you're going to feel when you die, because that's how you get into ketosis through dehydration. Interesting. Now, people listening, just as a side note, because I want people to understand, people listening will be like, dehydration is so painful, blah, blah, blah. Dehydration in a dying body is not painful. It will help people die. Dehydration is painful if you're a healthy person who's like lost in the desert. Yes, because you're healthy, your body's not ready. But your body has, or when you're a dying body, which on hospice, you know, people have six months or less to live, that, that six months, our body knows what's going on and is preparing slowly. That is why you your loved one won't eat. That's why they don't want to drink. That's why they're sleeping all the time because their body's going, hey, we know what's going on here. We're preparing ourselves. And the more we do that, the more it can get into ketosis and then you know endorphins are released and they can die peacefully. What about uh, the body, re- the brain uh, releasing this DMT molecule. Sometimes they call it the God particle. I think that's what they refer to as the God particle, DMT. And, and people start to, well, some have attributed DMT to, you know, deathbed hallucinations when they say, oh, I, you know, I see my husband. He's waiting for me on the other side. What are your thoughts? My thoughts on that. Okay, so one, deathbed, deathbed phenomenon. That's chapter six in my book because mm-hmm. I, I am someone, especially as an ICU nurse, just so everyone knows, would not have believed <laughs> the stuff that happens on hospice as far as like deathbed phenomena. But it happens so now that I'm a hospice nurse and I've been doing it for eight years. The visioning. So visioning is one of the things that happens. The two things I see the most are the rally, which we can talk yeah. about in a second. That's the number one thing I see. Number, the second thing I see all the time is visioning. Now, we do not know why it happens. People might say, well, it could, it could be DMT releasing. It could be a, a, a rush of cortisol releasing. But technically, we don't really know. There hasn't been studies to prove why it's happening. All we know is that it does. And it does happen worldwide across all cultures. Um, and the visioning to me is so fascinating because I have seen ICU psychosis. I have seen people act in funny because of medications or delirium or terminal agitation, things like that, that can cause something like this. Visioning to me is something very specific. And it usually happens about a month before someone dies. So that means they're still like walking and talking and not on a bunch of medications and they're lucid and they'll say that they see these things. Um, and that usually tells me, so what my like scientific brain Go, says is, oh, they have about a month to live. Once a patient tells me that they're seeing things, if they do, a lot of times they don't because they don't want to tell anybody. Um, the reason why I think I get so many people telling me is because I specifically educate about it. And a sign, I try not to be like, uh, I try not to give any kind of personal like opinion about it. I just say, listen, if this starts happening, as long as it feels good and doesn't scare you, like we're good. You're not going, you're not losing your mind. You know, this is just something that happens. And because I say that people will say, Oh, it's already happening. Mm. Oh, it's already happened. And I'm like, okay. You know, and really it is a timeline. I mean, to me, it's a timeline. If someone's saying that they usually have about a month left. Well, my, my mother, before we moved her into the hospice and she was there for about three weeks, we kept her home as long as we could. She saw, my her sister, my late aunt, outside the the living room window, uh, wow. and my mother in law who passed here at the house uh, six months ago, yesterday actually, uh, she she was sitting in front of the TV. This is about a month before she passed, sitting in front of the TV eating, uh, and she said to my wife, "Did you see that?" She said, "No, what happened, mom?" She said, "A fairy flew from the shelf next to the TV and landed on her plate." and then passed away. Wow. Yeah, a month later she was gone. A month later she was gone. Yeah. See, 
So I'm sorry I didn't really answer your question about the DMT thing. My whole, I guess my whole point is like, I, I truly am not being like, it means they are seeing people. Right. I don't know. Right. I don't, we don't know. Maybe it's DMT. Maybe it is something that the veil is being lifted and they can really see things that we can't see yet. Who knows? All I know is if it's visioning, it will be comforting. So people who people are like, well, my person saw the devil or, or saw mm-hmm. some guy in a black cloak and it was really scary. I don't think that's visioning. From my experience, visioning is always something that is like either interesting or comforting. Right. Uh, and there are some specific diseases that actually Parkinson's specifically um, that one of the symptoms is seeing things See, and it can be good and bad. Right. So. There's certain diseases where it's like, is it visioning or is it a symptom? It's hard to know. But man, I wouldn't have believed it, except I see it so often and so clearly. And it's very different than any kind of like delirium or hallucination or agitation that I would see otherwise. Hospice nurse Julie, Julie McFadden, demystifying death to live more uh, fully. Back with more in a moment. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete, unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So help me fight big tech censorship. Enjoy the complete unedited episodes and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there. Nothing to fear. Demystifying death live more fully. Nurse Julie McFadden, Hospice Nurse Julie, at Hospice Nurse Julie on uh, TikTok, where she has uh, over 3 million followers, well, across social media, including uh, TikTok. Um, You mentioned, well, let's talk about some of the other uh, deathbed phenomena. You mentioned the rally. Um, This is when we basically think the end is nigh and then all of a sudden they regain what consciousness they're, they're, they're verbalizing again. Maybe they have an appetite. Yeah. Yeah. All the things can happen. So, um, Grey's Anatomy got it right this time. There was an episode on Grey's Anatomy where someone had the rally. Now he had a really big rally. So it can be, it can be, uh, like you said, someone's very close to death. They're doing very poorly, maybe unconscious. And then suddenly They have this burst of energy. Sometimes they just wake up, like you said, and they're conscious and they can talk. Sometimes you'll find them, you'll go, like my grandma specifically, she had one. She was unconscious and mostly sleeping. All of a sudden my mom went to visit her. She was out of bed trying to be like, trying to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. So it can be as big as that too, where they're actually out of bed, their personality, their sass, or however their personality was can come back. They're hungry. And you're thinking like, wow, what's going on here? Um, and then they die. So the, the trick to the rally that people need to understand is if someone stays like that, if they have a good day and then they stay well for a week or two, that is not the rally because the rally is a burst of energy. So you are down burst of energy, you're up and then you die. Hmm. So it's usually a day or two after, if you don't die right away, you at least go back to being unconscious. Yeah. I had a woman who I thought was having a rally, but then she lived for three months. And that to me was like, I mean, a miracle. So, so because she shouldn't have lived for three months. So the rally is specific down burst of energy up and then dead. And that's where it's like, you need to edge. I always want to educate my families before the rally happens. So when they're having the rally, I don't have to be the bearer of bad news and go, you know, they might, 
die. I, I still always do. I still always break the hard news because yeah. I want people to know, but I always try to educate before. And it happens way more than you think. So it happens in like one third of all of our patients. It doesn't always get reported and people don't always know that that's what it was until it was done. Right. But it happens a lot. I don't know if my, this was a rally, but my mother, again, she was at home before hospice. So maybe a, a month before she passed, maybe a couple of weeks before she went into hospice, uh, she was in bed and uh, the, um, uh, the care workers were over at the house and they suggested that, we, you know, maybe we stop giving her food and, and, and water because she was sleeping most of the time. My brother and I came home one weekend and she got up, she came to the dinner table and she had steak with us. And, you know, we still knew, you know, she's not going to bounce back. This is, it's, she's getting near the end, but still that was such a gift. You know, it's like one last meal at the dinner table as a family steak of all things steak. That's not easy to digest. That's not easy to chew or digest. No, well, she she died with all her teeth. So that helped. But, um, what is, is there a physiological explanation or is it just a mystery? The rally mystery, all the deathbed phenomena I talk about, there's theories, of course, you know, is that a is that a surge of cortisol for whatever reason the body knows it's dying, so it gives you a burst so you can kind of have those moments, mm. um, but nothing for sure. Unfortunately, I think because I don't know why, but death doesn't seem to be really scientifically studied, at least not that much. So, like, we're not going to make someone at the end of their life go through a bunch of blood tests and blood work, and so we can try to figure out what's happening during these times, you know. So. Maybe that's why it's a mystery. Maybe if we like only because if we had actual people who'd want to go through all that, we would figure it out. But hmm. as of now, it's a mystery, but yeah. it happens a lot, a lot, a lot. And I think what you experienced right there, I think that sounds like the rally. Maybe it wasn't as like she died right afterwards, but if it was just like a, the whole point is like the burst where it's not like they're continuously having a, a good month or something. Right. Right. Do you get uh, interesting deathbed requests from people? Ooh, that's a good one. No, not it's just not really. People always ask me that that or if I get like confessions, mm. and I don't. I kind of wish I did. <laughs> I don't. What, what not maybe not a confession, but what about um, people expressing regrets? Yeah. So the biggest thing people have said to me, and it's 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 all kind of connected, is wishing they didn't take their health for granted. Mm. I think it's so easy, and I, I think about this every day. I, I put this on my grateful list every single day that I have health, that I can walk and move and eat and not feel nauseous and feel pretty good day to day because people always say they they regret or they feel bad that they didn't realize how good life was. And now that they're sick, it's been so much harder. So that's one. Second thing is they wish they didn't work their life away. Mm. Now that's hard. You know, You know, everyone can say that but it's hard when you live in a society where you kind of have to work to live, but yeah. people always say, I wish I didn't work my life away. Um, and again, a touchy thing because family dynamics are great are, you know, different, but I wish I would have spent more time with friends and family. I think the main thing is just appreciating life. Yeah. What it is. Yeah. Well, hence the, the, I, the title of the book, demystifying death to live more fully. Has to live more fully. Cause to me, it's not about, I realize we all, we live in a day and age where, you know, you might, you have a family, you have to work, you have to do these things to keep this life going, or at least it feels like you have to. And is there a way that we can still reframe how we're seeing the world so we can really enjoy the sunlight, Mm. right? Flowers, trees, your television, electricity, cold water, like little things that, that really are big things. But we just are living this world where it's not anymore. So that's what dying people have taught me is to appreciate little things, everything. For sure. Because when you're, when you're there, when you're facing your own, your own death, it seems like they finally get it. They finally get it. You share some, just some very practical things for the, the dying patient and their family, kind of a to-do list, you know, before you go, Make sure you have these things in order. Do you want to share some of those with us? Yes. <laughs> this is the hardest part. So this was the hard part of the book to write because I think it's 
it can feel boring. Like that, even, even reading that part for the audiobook, I was like, Oh God, but it's so important because the, the more prepared you are, think of it this way. We prepare for everything in life, <laughs> weddings, baby showers, school, the day where we prepare for everything, but we never prepare for the thing that's going to happen to all of us, which is death. Mm-hmm. And the more you prepare for it, which I'll tell you in a second, what to do, the more it'll be easier on you and really easy on your family. Mm. You want it? on your family. So get your financial anything in order. What does that mean? Even if you think you have nothing, I would still pay the money and talk to a lawyer, an estate planning lawyer, to help you get things in order because you would not believe the shit show. Sorry to swear. <laughs> if, if you don't. Yeah. If you don't. Exactly. So get it in order. Contact a lawyer and get it in order. Even if you think you're broke and you have nothing, still do it. Well, particularly That's if you want your children to get along after you go. Particularly if you want your children to get along after you go. Mm -hmm. Yes. Also, let your children, every one of them, every one of your children and everyone around you who's going to be in your care, what you want physically at the end of your life. Do you want to go to the hospital? Do you want to be intubated? Do you want CPR? Do you want treatment? Would you want, you know, all the different scenarios. You tell them what you want and you write it down. Also, a lawyer should be involved just to get it notarized, make it legal. Sometimes of all the families on board, like if you have five kids and you tell them all and they all say, okay, I think it's still important to make it legal, but also like at least they all know. So you're not going to have the one outlier. You killed mom. You didn't do anything. You know, Mm -hmm. like we all know what mom wants. That's what, so you need to get everyone on the same page on what you want. Get your funeral plans in order, all your mortuary plans. Do you want to be cremated? Do you want to be buried? Do you have a plot? Do you want to have a funeral? What do you want your obituary to say? Mm. And maybe you don't really care, right? So if you don't really care, you can tell your family, you know what, I don't really care. Do whatever's cheapest for you. Or here's $2,000, do whatever you want with my body when you're done, if you don't really care. Some people are really specific, but just make sure you vocalize this to everyone because everyone needs to know. Right. What about, there's some real practical things uh, too, like passwords and, the combination to the safe. (laughs) Yes. So like, think about all the, uh, you know, like my sister, I'm 41. She's 43. She has, she, I have it written down and she knows where it's written down. My, the password to my phone to get into my phone, Mm. the password to my bank accounts. She's the beneficiary for my bank accounts as well, but you also want to do that. So the passwords to like your bank accounts, passwords to get into your computer, um, the passwords to the PO box or the keys to the PO box, any little thing, mm-hmm. someone needs to know those things. So it's these practical things um, that I've written down in the book. So you can physically know step by step what to do, how to do it, where to start. And it's just going to make things easier. And it's never too early to start. I am 41 years old. This is done for me. Now it's going to change as the years go on, right? So I'm going to have to redo it probably every five years or whatever. But it's never too early. you got to get your things in order um, to help yourself and to help your loved ones. It's going to make things go so much smoother, so much smoother. How do you feel about death for you personally, your death, many, 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 many decades from now? Yes. I think I feel like you, Richard, like you said, I'm in no rush. I would love both my grandparents died in their mid-90s, both my sets of grandparents, so I hope I have their genes. So yeah, I hope I live a long life. I would love to die on hospice in my bed in my nineties. Mm-hmm. Would love that. Um, and if I die tomorrow in some kind of like tragic accident, not that I want that, but I know I'll be okay. And I'm like you, I'm really curious about what's next. And I had my, be- I have beliefs of what's next. And I know I could be wrong because beliefs are just beliefs, right? But uh, and maybe I will be wrong, and that that'll be okay too. I think. Um, Cause here's side note. Here's what I think about that. Like, even if I'm wrong and we just die and our consciousness goes away, well then I'm dead. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm, just God. I'm not going to know. <laughs> so, so that'll be okay too. I don't think that's what happened and I don't want that to happen, but if that's what it is, I'm not going to know anyway. So it is what it is. So in general, I don't want to die. If I get diagnosed with something tomorrow that's terminal, I'll go through the human experience of anger and sadness and being scared. But generally speaking, 
uh, I'm okay with it. So what is next, do you think? I think we go to a place, like for me personally, I have always felt homesick for like a place that I have forgotten. Hmm. And I feel like when I die and wake up or whatever you want to say, call it, in this place, I'm going to be like, oh my God, <laughs> finally I'm back. I've missed you guys. Like, I can't believe I couldn't remember this. Um, but I, but I have a feeling that that's like, it's like, I'm going home Yeah, I'm going home. and I feel like it's going to feel much more home than here ever has. And I just can't remember. So it's, so it's like, I have to get there to remember. And I think that because when I see, well, one, there's several things that have happened in my life to make me think that, but the two big things that I can really try to describe it as is like, when I see a baby, a pretty newborn baby, there's a feeling I get of like, they've come from this place. Mm. Like they, they were just there. I can like see it in their face. And I have this feeling of like awe and wonder and like time stands still and it feels good. And it feels like, Oh, this is so magical and amazing. And I feel that when I see someone take their last breath, I feel the same thing. And I think because the grief isn't there, cause it's not my loved one. Right. I'm able to feel it. I think if it was my mom, I wouldn't feel it because I'd probably be so sad that she's dying, right? right? But because I'm just witnessing it and helping people, I have that same feeling. I think death and birth are like, we're coming from the same place and they're just going back to the same place. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Well, <laughs> here's to That's going awesome. home. Yeah. Demystifying death to live more fully. Nothing to fear. Julie McFadden, thank you so much. Great to meet you. You too. Thank you. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete, unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So help me fight big tech censorship. Enjoy the complete unedited episodes and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there.